Yeah, uh, Richard, you can start because uh, I think uh, it's the uh, time. Yeah, so I think we can start, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, hello everyone. I welcome you all to this parallel session of ASI on Sun and Solar System. I am Vagis Misra. I will be chairing this session and I'm currently working as a faculty at Indian Institute of Astrophysics. So we have uh, five talks in this session. The first talk will be of 30 minutes and others are of 15 minutes. So the first talk is by Professor Durgesh Tripathi. He is currently working at uh, IUCA, Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, Pune. He is also PIE of the one payload suit on the Aditya mission, which will be launched soon. So Professor Tripathi will be talking about heating of transition region between the solar chromosphere and corona. So please join me in welcoming Professor Tripathi to begin his talk. I hand over to Professor Durgesh, please. OK, uh, thank you, Avish. Uh, so you will tell me uh, after 20 yeah. minutes or after 25 minutes? At yeah, 25 minutes. At 25 minutes, OK. Um, all right. Uh, so let me just share my screen. Can you see my screen? In yes. Yeah, OK. Yeah. All right, so uh, thank you very much and uh, inviting me to give this talk uh, and uh, it would be nice to give this talk in person for after so long, but um, but couldn't make it and um, I was telling Nandita that we sacrificed for other people to go there, so we didn't go there. Um, Okay, so um, I'm going to be uh, talking to you today about heating and dynamics of solar region in particular. And uh, this work is uh, done in, uh, my, in the collaboration with two of my PhD students. So Avirthana Ghosh, who has finished and is part of her uh, PhD thesis, which Avishek Rajhans is now carrying out further and in collaboration with Jim Klimchuk. Now, let me put it up front that whatever we're going, I'm going to tell you today is just some ideas which, which is evolving. We have put in some ideas that how actually we can explain or try to understand uh, solar transition region um, you know, emission and other observational parameters, but there is still a lot of work needs to be done which, which can help us understand this better. Now, um, since this, uh, this Audience is mixed, which would be from very beginning. So I thought I'll introduce you what a transition region is and then tell you the, the observational features we have there and how actually we are trying to, are, are trying to understand in terms of impulsive heating uh, ways and, and what may work or what may not work and what we know that that doesn't work and so on. All right, so um, when we look into tra solar transition region, we have photosphere, chromosphere, transition region, and corona. And, uh, and, and, and this is a plot here, which, uh, which plots uh, temperature on x-axis and mass density on uh, temperature on left y-axis, mass density on right y-axis. And on x-axis, you have uh, height. So, so this region particularly here, uh, Bagis, can you see my mouse? Yes, it's visible. Okay. Excellent, thanks. Um, so that's the region we are trying to focus today. Uh, as you can see from chromosphere, of course, you start seeing an uh, increase in temperature above the photospheric temperature, but there is a steep rise here, which goes around from 10,000 degrees to about a million degree in this very short height, which is about a um, uh, few hundred kilometers. And that is the, the main region, transition region and the corona, which gives you all the extreme ultraviolet and X-rays. So the focus of talk today is this transition region. Now, um, it's a thin layer, which is interfacing the chromosphere with corona. And there are a lot of other lines which form here, right? As you can see, the density drops there, temperature increases. So essentially what you can we are seeing here is a uh, maintaining a constant pressure uh, regime. Um, so the temperature increases from about 10,000, 50,000 degrees to, uh, to a million degree. Uh, it, and the density drops, so that essentially tells you that pressure remains almost uh, constant. It can be divided into two parts, uh, lower transition region, so the, the, the spectral lines essentially which are forming below 50,000 degrees, and higher transition region or upper transition region where the, the lines are forming above 50,000 degrees. And if you look at the images of transition regions, 
they are essentially populated by foot point of coronal loops, both heart and one loops and open feed lines. All kind of foot, all kind of loop structures you're seeing into the corona. The foot points are rooted there. You see plaids, you see moss, and, and you see other small bright ring in the transition region. So that essentially is uh, because of the foot points of these uh, coronal loops. In addition, you also have mostly in Quaxon region, you have cool transition region loops, which has been recently observed in, uh, in iris, uh, iris data. Now, if you look at this lower transition region and upper transition region images, what you see is, this is a carbon-4 image, full disk span. Um, that mimics more like chromosphere, right? So this is, we are looking at uh, uh, carbon-4, which is, which is lower transition region. And that shows the structures which are very similar to chromospheric structures such as plas, network, et cetera, you can identify in this image, as well as you have this uh, limb brightening. But if you go in the upper uh, transition region, for example, if you take into uh, iron 9 um, uh, line or iron 7 line, for example, which is forming around 80,000 degrees or, or 90,000 degrees, what you start seeing that the, uh, the structures there, they start mimicking more like what you see in the corona, like the active region loops, you also have moss and so on. Now, what is believed or rather what people have been thinking about so far is that the transition region is mostly heated by the thermal conduction front, which is coming from the corona. So you have the thermal conduction because corona is hot, you have thermal conduction flux going towards the foot point that is heating and maintaining the, uh, the transition region. Theoretically, in some simulations, when actually people want to, uh, for example, if you have a, a one dimensional loop and you are trying to look at where is the corona, where is the transition region, what they define is that the, the, the region where the thermal conduction change changes from being a cooling term. So it's a, it's a sort of heat distribution in the corona. Essentially it's cooling the corona and then it comes down to the foot point and heats the plasma up and that changes from a cooling term to a heating term. So that's one way of putting um, uh, the definition of transition region uh, from a theoretical perspective. Now, if we have, if we believe that the transition region heated by, uh, by the thermal conduction flux, which is coming from corona, then it has to explain number of observations we have uh, available for transition regions. For example, we have intensities in transition region lines and that we can observe direct intensities as well as if you want to take many, many uh, spectral lines which is covering both transition region and the corona, then you have to be able to uh, explain the differential emission major distribution which we obtain all the way from lower transition region, upper transition region, and into the corona. Here is, is one example. Look at the black one. Please ignore the, the uh, uh, this year, uh, the, the gray uh, dotted uh, curve. If you look at uh, uh, this uh, DEM curve, this is for quiet sun, so that peaks at around a million degree. Then there is a dip at around 5.5. And then if you go towards the lower transition region, there is a sort of a steep increase in the transition uh, region emission, right? So there, so of course, there is a density is increasing here but then the density is increasing on this side. So what exactly happens at this layer? And that is where the interface region is between the upper transition region and the lower transition region. And so if, if we understand or think that the whole transition region is sort of uh, heated and maintained by the conduction flux from the corona, then that, that explanation has to explain the whole uh, uh, emission measure distribution. The, the other observations we have is a Doppler shift in transition region spectral lines. So this is an intensity image from iris silicon four, and this is silicon four velocity at each pixels. And what you find is that there are two main polarities here, which I'll show you later, but there are two main polarities, positive and negative. And there's a polarity inversion line here. There's a kind of a skiing track, as you can see. There, the velocity is very close to zero, but in the two dominant polarities, you have very strong blue shift and it can be as high as up to, um, uh, not blue shift, red shift, as high as about 30 kilometers per second. So, so this thermal conduction flux theory has to then explain this very strong downflows which we observe in transition region spectral lines. Now, when we think of this coronal heating and combine that with the heating of transition region and the conduction flux coming from, from the corona, 
uh, and, and going towards the transition region, we are talking about impulsive heating mechanism. What essentially it means is that if you look at these observations, so for example, uh, this is a SOHO EIT image, there is this loop structure here. If you zoom it up and, and go look in with the higher resolution, uh, for example, this is trace, you see that each of these loops are not a single entity, but rather they are made up of uh, fundamental flux strands, which are still not fully resolved, right? So, so what you are talking about is in, in terms of um, uh, a scenario is that any coronal loop, if we can mimic it that this as a, as a whole thing as a coronal loop, which is made up of number of strands which are interwined together because of the photospheric motions. And because of this interwining, there could be a lot of current sheets which are forming along those uh, uh, strands. And because of that, there could be reconnections occurring in two different strands and, and leading to energetic events. So here is, for example, there could be many with different durations and different times and, and, and different uh, amplitudes and so on. So what we talk about impulsive heating is like when you, the, the difference, the time difference between two events is larger than the cooling time. So the idea is that you have one event taking place and then it cools down to a level before the second event is happening. So what essentially you're talking about that if you have a heating event, let's say this happens, you are generating heat, the, uh, the, the heat is conducted downwards towards the foot point. At foot point means the, the transition region and the chromosphere. Now, if you put the energy or dump that energy at the foot points on a very fast time scale, a very short time scale, then the plasma does not, the chromospheric plasma or the transition region plasma does not get enough time to react to it such that, because the density is very large, so you're putting energy, and if you're only thinking about very strong uh, sort of cooling, then uh, the, because of the larger density, it should cool down really fast. But if the energy deposition becomes on a time scale, which is very, very fast, then what you're talking about is plasma becoming unstable. And if it becomes unstable, ionized, then it will flow along the field lines. So you'll start seeing chromospheric evaporation going along these field lines. Now, if these events are happening at times where the duration between two events is larger than all these mechanisms happening, then what you're talking about is like a cycles of upflows and then cooling down, and then those plasma will cool down and fall uh, again back towards the foot point. And that can explain the high temperature upflows and lower temperature downflows, which is just draining and cooling towards the transition region. And this scenario has been very successful in explaining, for example, uh, multi-thermal structures. So for example, if you have number of events taking place and a lot of events are taking place at uh, uh, with time intervals, which is larger than the cooling time, then what essentially you're talking about all these, so if you take one and measure the temperature structure across the loop, then you would have many strands at different temperatures. That therefore it will give you a multi-temperature structure, multi-thermal structure across the field with also a symmetric line profile. So for example, if you dump an energy here, plasma is just flowing upwards. So if you look at the foot point of the loop, that the whole line is shifted. So this is simulation from uh, Patsurakos and Klimchuk. And, and you see that the whole line profile is shifted at the foot point. Now, if you take the whole loop as an on average and look at the what the, the line profile will look like, what you would see would be just a sort of small uh, bump in the blue, which is showing um, uh, uh, which is mimicking the upflows in a very high temperature lines. And then eventually when this plasma has filled up the loop, eventually it has to cool down and at uh, spectral lines, which are below 2 million degrees, uh, and, uh, 1 million, 1 1.5, and even transition region, you start seeing downflows. And this is here at silicon, uh, silicon seven line, which is around 1 million degrees. And if you measure the Doppler shift, you see this, all these loops are just downflow. If you think in terms of high frequency heating that the number of events are happening really, really fast, it doesn't get time to cool. So, so, so statistically what you're talking about 
kind of uh, static structure. You would not have any um, uh, definite Doppler shift because the heating and cooling and, and the upflows and downflows are happening simultaneously. And the temperature will be maintained. So you will be thinking about isothermal loop structures, which does not work uh, very much. So, so this, this is more like a uh, favorable picture when we're talking about activation loops. But remember that these loops are eventually they're rooted in the transition region. So they have to also explain that transition region dynamics. So the question we are then asking is, can we also reproduce transition region dynamics self-consistently by these impulsive heating mechanism? Now, one of the things one can look at to, to see a combined way that how the transition region is behaving when com in combination to the, to the loop structures, which is in the corona. What we find that the active region MOS, so if you, if you look into transition region, so this is trace 171 angstrom image, you see these structures here, they're like a mossy uh, structure, we call them MOS. And the same region, if you take here in XRT, which is about three to five million degrees, and you take these loops here. So these two stars here are exactly the same two stars here. So what you find are a lot of loop structures here, which is seen at higher temperature in XRT images, they are rooted into these MOS regions. So these MOS are essentially the foot points of the hot loop structures, which we see in X-ray images. Now, if we, if we try to understand that uh, the emission which we see in these MOS regions, can they be explained by this impulsive heating scenario? Right? So the way we, uh, one can do it is to, to look at the, uh, if you take the energy equation, and in that you take some extreme uh, uh, assumptions. So for example, let's say there is strong evaporation. So, so when you have the conduction flux, it's evaporating the plasma. Can we think that the whole evaporation is just uh, showing the, uh, are powering the emission which we see in the transition region? The second case could be, that after the evaporation has happened, then you have an enthalpy flow, which is due to a strong condensation, is that the enthalpy flow is balanced with the radiative cooling of these MOS region. So therefore the, the, the enthalpy flux, which is coming from the corona is balanced by the radiative cooling or the static equilibrium that is the conduction flux, which is uh, coming from the corona and is just completely radiated away. And, and that in that case, then you would not have any dopplers. So that this here is already sort of uh, uh, um, uh, not taken into account because this is not explaining the Doppler shift which we observe in the transition region, right? So, so if we do that, then we come up with these expressions, right? So, so uh, we can derive emission major distribution in the first case, which is a static equilibrium. The second case where there is strong condensation which is powering the radiation. And the third case is a strong evaporation. Now, what we could do is we can compute the emission measure distribution in these three cases and compare that with the emission measure distribution we observe in the transition region lines for the for MOS, uh, for example. What we do here, we take everything as a constant. We only care about the temperature. Why, why we do that? Because the, uh, we consider that the average pressure and mass flux are considered to be constant along the, along the given loop. And we restrict ourselves only with the temperature dependence of the EM curves. And if we do that, so, so we took these two regions, which are the mass regions, uh, and derived the uh, emission measure distribution. So these data points, the stars, uh, they are the observed um, major differential emission measure. And the solid lines with, uh, with diamonds, they are produced by these three uh, expressions. What we find, and of course, because we're only caring about the temperature, uh, temperature uh, effect and not caring about the, the other parameters, we cannot scale up and down to make it a better match and so on. Uh, but all we are interested in the trend, the way it is looking. Now, these are for the two regions, region A and region B. And you can right away, as I said in the beginning, you can discard this, the strong evaporation case, now, static equilibrium, although I said that one can discard it because it does not produce um, a Doppler shift, but it does a very good job at the lower temperature side, which is from 5.2 to up to about just a, less than a million. 
but then if it, it doesn't do a good job at higher temperature. Now, if we make it better at higher temperature, then this will go off and so on, because this can only scale up and down. Whereas if you look at the strong condensation case, which essentially tells you that the plasma is just cooling down, enthalpy flux, which is coming from the corona and matching or powering the emission from the transition region. And that I find is, of course, you look at these three data points as an outlier, which is also similar here, but by and large, this is a better representation than these two. Now, remember that this here, this curve is produced for one single strand, whereas this observation is for such big region and average thing. So, so what we're talking about, if we take a multiple strand, there will be a band of emission major distribution, which is obtained analytically. And therefore, this appears to be a better representation for, um, uh, for the emission major distribution for MOS regions. So well reproduced impulsive heating scenarios. So the MOS intensities we can, we can reproduce. Now, if we have this strong condensation, what kind of Doppler shift we find in the MOS region? And here is, um, oops, this came before than I had wanted to. Um, I don't know. So this is, uh, this is, these are uh, SUMER observations uh, done in 2013. Uh, the paper came out in 13. The data is from 1999. Um, this is looking at active region mass. And as you know, SUMER was a very good instrument measuring velocities um, as good as about one to two kilometers per second. And here we have a major velocities in three different lines. So these are two carbon four lines. So the same temperature, but neon eight, is, is a, a higher temperature just or below a million degree. What you find here is that all three lines are showing, now here is negative in, 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 in this um, terminology, negative means redshift. Um, all three lines are redshifted. Uh, the redshift increase as you go towards the lower temperature. Now there is a problem with that. So let me just, put the persistent downflows observed in mass region, but the amplitude of Doppler shift increases with decreasing temperature. And that is a problem. The problem is that under the constant pressure and constant mass flux assumption, what we find is that the velocity should be proportional to temperature, right? So if you just take rho V equals to constant and you take this constant pressure and constant mass flux, then what you would get is the velocity should be proportional to T. Therefore, when you're going from uh, higher temperature to lower temperature, your uh, Doppler shift should be reducing accordingly. But that doesn't work here. And we find that uh, is, is ultra. Therefore, we need something else to explain these observations, right? Now, if we take simple topology of active region and try to put an impulsive heating concept, what should we be finding? If, we, if the active region has two bipole here, the left and right, and the loop structures are, are connecting the two, uh, two foot points or two major polarities, and of course you will have these connecting foot points uh, uh, internally. And this, if this region is located at the disk center and you're observing from just on the top, then what you'd be seeing under this impulsive heating scenario for the transition region lines, that these two are strongly red shifted. And here you would find that because this is exactly perpendicular to your line of sight, the, the polarity in horizontal line would be showing zero velocity. Also, now if you think, think that this active region, the same has gone to the east limb, are to the west limb. What would you find? The velocity, the redshift, is still will be redshifted. But what would happen is that towards the limb, since you are looking uh, from from an angle which is almost going to be ninety degrees from your line of sight, you would get zero velocity, and then eventually you'll get a center to limb variation, maximum redshift at the disk center, and then zero at the other other limb. 
So you would you would produce both the the strong redshift as well as uh, a strong center to limb variation for Doppler shift. Do we see that in our observation? So here is an observation. Uh, again, silicon four line, as I showed you earlier. So this is the positive polarity. That's the negative polarity. A strong field region is just like these contours are 150 Gauss. This is uh, corresponding intensity in silicon four. And what you find exactly that matches very nicely with this, uh, with this picture here that you have very strong redshift here, very strong redshift there. And at the polarity inversion line, you see almost zero velocity, which is essentially uh, telling that the magnetic field, which is connecting the two polarities, is almost perpendicular to the line of sight. How about the center to limb variation? Now, center to limb variation has been studied for a very long time, and, and starting from Skylab and, and UVSP and so on. And here is a picture from Feldman et al looked at carbon-3, silicon-3, oxygen-4, silicon-4, neon-5, and oxygen-5. There are many data sets in here. What we're looking at here is disk center, here is the limb. And although you do see that there is, there is a sort of reduction in the Doppler shift. So if you take an average line and draw it here, you do see a reduction in the average Doppler shift when you're going from disk center to the limb but it doesn't go to zero. So if I take here about eight kilometers per second in this case, similar in this case, and even lower for neon five, which is at a little uh, higher temperature. So the disk center to limb variation is a problem. Because this was done with, with old data set and they had uh, issues with the calibration because they did not have proper reference we did that with silicon four, and this is uh, one active region which was tracked at its cross as it crossed the central meridian, and and we had like one, two, three, four, five, eight, uh, eight observations uh, at different mu values. So this is essentially now in other way uh, east limb, and this is west limb. So this is the uh, this is the the center of the disk, and it crossed from the eastern side to the western side. And as you can see, there is a mild, these are just to draw your eyes that what would be at 9.7 if we take them, this is the line we will get. If there was a proper center limb variation, essentially going to zero at the limbs. What we find is that, of course, there is the data is uh, limited. There is a mild center to limb variation, but it does not go all the way. So for example, this look at this red one, the central one, the, the two ones are taking the extreme value taking into the consideration the errors, but it still doesn't really match completely with what one would see as a center to limb variation expected from the impulsive heating. To build more statistics, uh, we have looked at now about 51 uh, active region, and this is this is taking the whole data set together. And, and what we find is now there is, there is uh, a lot of data, so, so it's still, uh, we can go all the way to limb, and, and you can still find when you go towards the limb, the, the velocities are sort of mimicking somewhat central limb variation, but not exactly the way it should, it should be done in the, uh, it should appear in the complete uh, um, um, impulsive heating. So how do we reconcile? So we have two problems. One is that the center limb variation is not completely in agreement. Secondly, the, the amplitude of Doppler shift. So, so when we go lower towards the temperature, we are talking about 10 kilometers or five to 10 kilometers per second, which is, which is seen here uh, of the Doppler shift, but impulsive heating mechanism, because the V becomes proportional to T for the lower temperature, they are able to produce for these kind of lines about one kilometers per second or even lower. So, so these two are sort of problems which needs to be uh, reconciled. Now, looking at the center to limb variation data uh, from, from Doshek et al. and Feldman et al., Antiochos in 1984 proposed this scenario, whereby when you have these loops connecting into the transition region and chromosphere and they're impulsively heated, then what you are talking about is if you have an impulsive heating and the heat is coming down towards the foot point, 
it is increasing the pressure because of that pressure the transition region and the chromosphere is depressed so it's pushed down in the atmosphere so you have transition region you have chromosphere but for the loop the transition region and the chromosphere is pushed down now depending on where you are looking from if you're looking from the top looking from left or looking from the right because of the opacity or the or the obscuration from these cooler material which is which is surrounded or the, the loops which is surrounded by the chromospheric cooler material you may or may not be able to observe the complete picture and therefore not the full component uh, full line of sight component of the of the uh, doppler shift only 5 minutes are left sure thanks so the red shifted radiation originate from a minority of flux tube which you can explain from here which have a higher gas pressure than the surrounding and consequently have their transition region situated below the chromosphere of their surrounding right so it just pushed down now the coronal heating in these has to be impulsive because you want to have this higher pressure you want to have an impulsive heating which push this down and therefore you are talking about flare like magnetic release or impulsive heating it is very appealing idea and it does help in understanding the observed centered limb variation of the Doppler pattern. And impulsive heating works very well in providing the consistent picture in terms of the extra pressure for the depressed transition region of the foot point. But there is a significant discrepancy because the V is proportional to T, so it still does not explain the magnitude of the velocities or the Doppler shift we are observing. And so the observed Doppler shift are an order of magnitude faster than the impulsive heating scenario provides. So that also has to be put into this. While uh, if we look into the, the different images of uh, active region and look at the PLAS and, and, the, and the MOS region, in the network regions or the, the uh, in the MOS region, there are black holes not the black hole, black hole, but there are darker regions within them where you see these spicules which are popping out. And I don't have an image for that, I should have put in. Um, so what we uh, put in, instead of chromospheric well, if you think in terms of chromospheric wall, then you might get away from these, both the problems. And what we have in mind is that you have two different kinds of spicules. One is the classical type one spicules, which are always there. And the others are type two spicules, which are more like a jet-like structures. And there, the tip of those spicules, so these type two spicules, they could get at as hot as about 0.1 or even a little hotter, and they might propagate into the corona. But the body of the type two spicules just just flows down and that shows a uh, redshift. So consider a scenario that you have these type two spicules which are pumping mass up into the transition region and which is surrounded by all these type one classical spicules like forest. And in this scenario then, depending on where you are looking from, you would either see this downflow or not see this downflow. And therefore, when you are looking from uh, measuring, making a center to limb variation uh, plot, then what you will find that it will not completely mimic the center to limb variation in, uh, uh, as compared to the idealized case when you have a loop and you're observing everything is down flowing, going from east limb uh, to the west limb. So this will, this will take away of that uh, scenario. And since this is providing additional downflow itself, so that might help us understand the downflows which we observe in the transition region, which is larger than what is produced by the uh, impulsive heating scenario. They obscure these downflows and statistically, therefore, there will not be significant CLV. And that is what uh, we are observing. So in summary, what heats the transition region it remains to be fascinating and challenging. While the impulsive heating of loops and the concept of chromospheric well may explain the basic feature of Doppler shifts, it does not account for the magnitude of the Doppler shift that is observed. The idea of chromospheric wall instead of well and the downflows due to type two spicules, it, 
explains the basic feature for CLV, for not so well defined CLV in the Doppler shift. The downflow associated with the spicules may have the same Doppler shift as, as observed. And, and there are some indications to that, that the spicules downflow are similar about 10, 15 kilometers. And that is what we see in these, uh, these images of silicon four and, and spectra. It may also account for the enhanced transition region emission. As, as if you remember my, my second slide, when I talked about the emission measure distribution, which was steeply increasing when you're going towards the lower transition region, and that may be accounted by, for by uh, these spicule material, which is just downflowing because it has its own mass and doesn't have to come all the way from the corona, but it's just the, the, the spicules which are generated maybe in the chromosphere going all the way to the transition region and coming back. So that will provide in, uh, extra uh, emission and that might be uh, taken into account to explain this transition region emission. But we still need a lot of other observations which has to be supported with simulations to understand this, uh, this problem better. So with that, thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions if there are. Yeah, so please uh, ask questions, raise hands, and then I will point out either text your question in the chat box. Yeah, so there is a question from Jayan Joshi, please go ahead. Hi, uh, very good presentation, Rukesh. Uh, actually, I wanted to know that if, if there is a, a symmetry being observed in the center to nerve variation, depending on the which foot point you look, because the geometry you showed in the slide 13, actually, depending on the your viewing angle, you might see the down so stronger in the one foot point. And so, for example, if you're looking and the flow is aligned along the field lines, then you might see when you're looking away from the disc center, you might see the stronger redshift in the foot point, which is toward the limb compared to the foot point toward the disc center. Yeah, so, so the idea is that everything will average out, right? If you're looking at, uh, at both and uh, the line of sight is, is going across all those loops. So in one side, you'll be uh, from the viewing angle point, one side you will see red shift and the other foot point will show sort of blue shift, they'll all cancel out. So eventually you'll go to zero. Okay. Right? Yeah, so yeah. it would be nice to just uh, look at. I mean, so I'm I'm trying to do this simulation where uh, by one D loop, if we can uh, we can model this that by just looking at one foot point how the center to limb variation will go, and and you look at both how the center to limb variation will go. So that work is still uh, ongoing. But that's a, that's a good thing to to check in. Okay. Uh, may I ask one another yeah. question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there is this paper <clears throat> in Nature Astronomy by Patrick and Donald. Antonin and he see this uh, bidirectional jet in the silicon uh, silicon line from iris. So that is one of the clear indication of impulsive heating looking off limb. So it, while looking on the disk center data, there is there any way to kind of find out this impulsive event? Is now is the raster scan? So you look at the downflow and everything. So on average, you see the downflow and that is attributed to the heating impulsive heating, but particular impulsive event like by individual cases. Can it be observed on the disk center, uh, on the disk data? On the disk, it's going to be very challenging because yeah. silicon four is, is by and large optically thin line. So you don't really know where it is happening. Um, it will all be integrated along, right? Whereas off limb, it's easier. That's what Patrick has done. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, it's a very nice paper. Um, but yeah, I haven't thought about it. I think it'll be difficult, but- um, or, yeah. or in the case, if you put the slit and stare for a very long time from the iris and then able to see some impulsive variation in the Doppler shift kind yeah. of thing. I mean, uh, have you seen this paper by uh, Davina Inas by Sumer uh, bidirectional flows? And that yes. was essentially on disk. So I think yeah. that is also in carbon four and neon eight, I think. Uh, if I remember well, yeah. So probably that's similar thing, but that okay. is on disk and that's a sit and stare observation. So maybe have a look at that paper. That might okay. Yeah, thank you. So Sudeep has a question, please go ahead. Yeah, Sudeep, unmute yourself and ask. Oh, hi, okay. I couldn't unmute. Okay, nice talk, Durgesa. Uh, my question was similarly uh, on the similar lines which Chant asked. Um, so in the initial part of your talk, you um, spoke about mostly about the heat conduction front coming from uh, up top uh, towards uh, transition region in terms of geometrical heights. Uh, so there are a lot of in-house um, uh, small scale um, 
reconnection like uh, um, events are occurring near about transition region which produce uh, what giant also mentioned about the bidirectional jets which in in in, in terms uh, contributes towards your doppler uh, variations which you observe so how do you see them all coupling together because uh, there are we know uh, from our theoretical understanding that there are small scale unresolved things going on all the time so how do you see the all these things coming together that is correct yeah so what we are talking about here is an on average behavior mm -hmm. so uh, so that all will be sort of uh, accounted into it and uh, um i mean when you talk about the jet structures which are uh, are impulsive events local impulsive event which are happening in the in the transition region they might still mimic the same geometry as is shown here mm -hmm. right and uh, and you do, do you still see all these uh, classical type one spicules which are surrounded surrounding that right so uh, so similar feature similar structure will be there and and possibly the result will will turn out to be with the same so so what you're essentially saying that it may not everything be type 2 spicules but also some small scale jets which are happening in there um, which might might affect this as well mm -hmm. okay yeah. yeah thanks okay so now time to move to the next talk so thanks the speaker for this uh, informative talk so okay. now the next speaker is uh, dr ansu kumari so ansu please uh, share your screen she did her phd from iia bengaluru and now has moved for post doc position at uh, university of helsinki finland and uh, she will be talking about coronal magnetic field and uh, it's um, huge to track the early evolution of reflux rope which led to a cme please ansu thank you dr vagish is my slide slide yes, visible yes, yes. Uh, yeah okay then uh, Hi, I am Anshu. I work in Professor Emilia Kilper's Space Physics Research Group on understanding the formation, structure, and evolution of solar magnetic flux rope in the CMEs. In this talk, I will explain the methods and results from our recent work where we model active region 1, 2, 4, 7, 3 and study the effect of optimization parameters uh, on the non-inductive non electric field on the formation, evolution, and dynamics of flux rope. Uh, to begin with, we use the full disk uh, vector magnetograms from AIH HMI instrument. We produce the magnetogram cutouts as shown here. And then these cutouts, uh, the active region was tracked from east to west. And this was done to minimize the boundary effect. The left panel shows when we haven't done the masking for the cutouts. And the right panel is when we have done masking. And we have used a masking threshold of 250 uh, Gauss to remove any noisy spurious pixel. Uh, the bottom panel shows the after the processing how the uh, cutouts would look like. So this is, we also then padded the data with uh, GeoZo. Um, also contains the total uh, flux imbalance and the computation field inversion, we use the electric field inversion code, code described by Lumia et al. 2017. This, uh, this uses the um, PTD method from uh, Kezachenko et al. 2014. And in this, the electric field is then decomposed into two parts, the inductive and the non-inductive components. And the inductive, com inductive component can be recovered using Faraday's law. And for non-inductive component, we have few options. For example, the zero omega and U assumptions. These are basically how we introduce twist to the system. Uh, the U, uh, for U and omega uh, parameter from henceforward will be called optimization parameters were studied in this work and uh, how, they, how changing this changes the flux rope appearance, its uh, formation and evolution in the simulation domain. We also studies the properties of flux rope, for example, their, their size, their magnetic field inside the uh, flux rope. Uh, so uh, previous studies have shown that if the non-inductive component, that is this, is not introduced, so without that, the photospheric helicity and energy will be severely underdetermined. Hence, we cannot simply ignore this fact. 
So next slide. Yeah. So the non-inductive component is crucial for accurately estimating the energy and helicity injection and the flux ropes early dynamics in the simulation. We optimize these two parameters, uh, uh, u and omega. And then with respect to an independent metric called the photospheric magnetic energy as a function of time as shown here, the photospheric magnetic energy uh, to the upper solar atmosphere was computed by integrating the pointing flux over time and an area and for any given choice of this optimization assumption and their values uh, we we estimated the we by using this we inverted it and we determined a reference value. Thus, a given reference magnetic energy injection is sufficient to determine the non-inductive component of the driving electric field. So, after optimization, we we found the values of these two optimization parameter omega and u as shown here uh, for both the cases masked and unmasked. Uh, the aim is to study the effect of these uh, optimization parameter on the data-driven kernel simulation. By varying these three parameters, we can explore the changes in optimization, uh, changes in the appearance of the flux rope, its evolution, its eruption, and its other properties. In order to achieve it, uh, we prepared the simulation uh, data for one by four times to four times of these values. So the energy injection uh, values are shown here uh, for all the prepared data and it matches uh, for the optimized value that is one times of the optimized value the energy in injection matches with the day 4 bm curve as obtained here uh, throughout uh, throughout the simulation domain uh, however for uh, when we look into the helicity injection values it does matches with the reference value that is from day 4 vm for the u assumption however it doesn't match uh, uh, for omega assumption that is uh, that is uh, because we did the optimization based on energy injection that is why the helicity injection may or may not match so the effect of this very high uh, helicity injection i will be showing the results later in this presentation so we use time dependent data driven magneto frictional model to drive the simulation it is a, it is a type of non linear force free modeling technique tmfm lies somewhere between the slow mht models uh, but and the fast but unrealistic uh, models uh, these these contains no dynamics because the magnetic uh, forces are so dominant then then all the other forces can be neglected uh, However, the uh, field aligned electric currents are allowed here and which can enable the measurement of magnetic free energy and helicity. In TMFM, the magnetic stress of the simulation is tried to uh, reduce during the process and hence uh, it is computationally efficient than MHD modeling and can be used uh, as time dependent, uh, unlike other models such as PFSS. Uh, hence, we use this TMFM uh, to drive the uh, simulation for AR12473 for, uh, for magneto frictional modeling. Uh, the main driving equations are Faraday's law. The second one is Ohm's law uh, in its resistive MHD form, where the first term correspond to the convective uh, electric field and the second term correspond to the resistivity added to uh, show the changes, uh, changing topology of the plasma. And the third terms represent an artificial velocity chosen such that the system evolves towards J cross B is equal to zero if there is net pointing vector introduced to the system. This allows the gradual buildup of magnetic current and uh, energy, hence the model is data driven and time dependent instead of just being a series of magnetic field extrapolation. Uh, we also have a uh, frictional coefficient nu, which is held constant during the simulation. We are working on changing it and seeing the effect on our results as a follow up study. So the main input to the simulation is the observed uh, horizontal electric field for the lower boundary condition which we prepared during the previous stage. Uh, after the simulation we also uh, calculated the volume matrices uh, that were magnetic energy and uh, uh, total uh, and relative helicity. The marks using these expressions, the black dots here represents the, in various simulation the first appearance of the flux rope and when the flux rope apex reached half of the simulation box. For us, the height of the simulation was 200 megameter, which corresponds to around 1.3 R0. So this, this black dot represents when the flux rope apex reached around 100 megameter. 
uh, and because of very high energy, we can see that for the omega runs, uh, uh, it, it these these values goes quite bizarre after some time. Uh, and that these effect will be sh shown in the uh, flux rope formation. For flux rope hunting in the simulation domain, we use the uh, metric called twist number. Twist number tells us how many turns two infinitesimally close field lines wind around each other. We use the method uh, described by uh, Berger and Prior uh, 2016. It was evaluated at the interested field lines area and it depends upon two parameters, parallel current and magnetic field. For a flux rope uh, uh, to be present there, at least the twist number value should be greater than one in its magnitude, can be positive or negative. The twist maps here uh, shows in, in rows for different optimization parameter values uh, uh, and the columns correspond to X times the optimization value we obtained. So uh, the twist is very low during the start of the simulation. That is because it, the simulation has been initialized by a potential field. Later in time, we can see this red color profile uh, appearing and moving uh, forward in, in, in Z direction. Uh, so that is the flux rope. It also has a blue uh, cap, which distinguish our flux rope from uh, 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 any other uh, ones surrounding the reason. And this twist, uh, twist, this twist number is always greater than one in our case, and it sl slowly increases uh, for, uh, up to four or six. The twist maps gets busier in top right and uh, later in time for omega runs. And that is because since there was severely high energy and helicity injection in omega runs, we had the uh, entire proce process just got finished within a, a couple of days. And other thing is just how the simulation domain looked like after the simulation, after the eruption, sorry. Uh, here is the snapshot of the flux rope in the simulation domain when the flux rope apex reached around uh, uh, the middle of the simulation box, that is 100 megameter. The seed points for these flux ropes are different in different runs. However, looking at the twist map and the very well-defined flux rope, we were very sure that we were tracking the same flux rope in all the runs. These flux rope have been, uh, have been emerged at different times and they evolved at different rates depending upon how much twist was uh, uh, in, in, uh, injected in the system because of a different type of optimization parameter and their different values. Uh, so at least one thing is sure that the higher optimization value, that means higher energy and helicity injection means the faster uh, the flux rope appears and it evolves in the simulation domain. So the table here uh, lists the flux rope parameters in various runs. Uh, we also had flux ropes evolve in the smallest optimization parameter value that was one by four times of uh, one by four times. Uh, but however, uh, the flux rope, we saw flux rope there. However, it could never evo uh, evolve to reach the high 100 megameter mark. So that those has been excluded in these plots. We also had uh, uh, simulation run for zero assumption that is energy is equal to zero, but no energy, hence no flux rope would have been seen. So that is why they are also not in these plots. So uh, th these three plots here shows the first appearance of the flux rope in all the simulation uh, domains. Uh, th this shows when it reached the height 100 megameter and it shows the time it takes for the evolution uh, from uh, first appearance to uh, the certain height. Uh, normally it is shown that it follows a pattern that means higher the value, higher the uh, faster the evolution and eruption. Uh, this list here shows, uh, the, the plots here shows some of the flux rope uh, parameter values, uh, uh, such as the magnetic, uh, the, the uh, accumulated helicity, the axial flux, et cetera. They, follow, they also follow the similar pattern. To summarize and conclude the work done, we conducted a time-dependent data-driven magnetofrictional modeling using an electric field inverted HMI vector magnetogram. We were able to reproduce clear flux rope in all the runs uh, where the non-inductive component was not zero, which included one by four times to four times of the optimization parameter, which basically indicates that uh, how much twist is being injected in our system. Uh, the flux rope were seen evolving and twisting and later erupting with time. Uh, flux ropes were uh, formed earlier in, uh, and it evolved faster in omega runs than U runs, possibly because of higher helicity injection. Flux rope 
We are also seen forming uh, earlier and rising earlier in masked simulation than unmasked one. That is again because higher energy and helicity was injected. injected. So TMFM simulation can be used to constrain magnetized uh, CME uh, 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 flux rope models inserted in hel heliospheric uh, simulation and to semi-empirical CME models. However, this study shows that irrespective of the values, flux ropes are formed and it's evolved and then it uh, erupts. So therefore, data-driven TMFM can be used to estimate flux rope uh, parameters or, or in their early evaluation without needing to imply a very lengthy and time-taking optimization process. So we are... Uh, to move forward, we are working on coupling this with MHT by one of my colleagues, and we are also working on tracking these flux ropes uh, automatically. So, thank you. So, thanks, Ansu. So, now it's time for question. So, please raise your hands or type your questions in the chat, please. So, Dibindu Nandi has one question, please. Yeah, please unmute yourself and yeah, ask your question. I think uh, so. So, Dibyandu, I think uh, you are muted. So, now I can take the next other question from Bhargav Vedya. Please, Bhargav, go ahead. I think they are unable to unmute or there is some problem. So, Okay, so both have texted that uh, they cannot unmute. So, can you please type your question? Uh, Vagish, in the meantime, we have some offline questions also. Okay, so please take one of them from there. Thank you, Mr. Pada, very nice. Pandit Sharma, Pandit Sharma, Pandit and so can you wondering that in your uh, TMFM model, how do you take care of the uh, divergence in the while running the simulation? So can you be this slightly louder? Sorry. Uh, I was wondering that in your uh, TMFM simulations, the equations that you showed, how do you take care of the divergence error that arises during the simulation? Uh, so we have this particular error bar. We have shown some. I, I don't think I have included it. Okay, so. Uh, it's not that all the simulation we run, we get flux ropes. So we do get in most of the time. So if there is some error, we may not be able to get flux ropes at the end of the simulation. So, and uh, I mean, uh, I can give you in detail a bit after talking to the two yens to other guy who develops the code here. <laughs> okay. So the Dibendu has typed the question. So can you please uh, answer that, Ansu? Yeah. I mean, this is uh, what we simulate is is very low in Corona, just till one point two eight R not. So I don't know if we can. I don't know if we can re. Uh, I mean, I don't think I can comment on it right now because I don't understand it much. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah. I think, yeah, later you can discuss that. So, yeah, if I will there either. are no more questions, let's move to, let's thank the speaker and move to the next talk. So, thanks, Ansu. So, you can unshare your screen. And uh, I request the next speaker, Kamles Bora. I think uh, she will be presenting offline. So, can the... Um, host uh, like confirm that if she is there offline yeah she is here okay so the next speaker is kamlesh bora she is a phd student at udaipur solar observatory working with uh, dr ramit bhattacharya she will speak on 
comparison of hall mhd and mhd evolution of a flaring active region so hand over to kamlesh please can online participant confirm are you able to see the screen yes yes we are able to see it So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk about my work in this ASI 2022 conference. So today I will be presenting uh, the data-based uh, Hall MHT and MHT simulation of a flaring active region, which is the first time uh, first time uh, we are simulating uh, we are doing the simulations of Hall MHT for a uh, real-time flaring event. So as we all know that. Uh, explosive phenomena on the sun are driven by the magnetic reconnection so there is some yeah okay yeah sorry for that uh, okay on the sun we know that explosive phenomena on the sun are basically driven by the phenomena called magnetic reconnection magnetic reconnection is basically a multi scale process where the uh, uh, small scale processes affect the large scale and uh, large scale dynamics affect the small scales and this can be visualized easily by the very famous standard flare model which is given at the middle of the uh, slide uh, or it is also known as chskp model where you can see a uh, in consequence of the, this large uh, blue color field line the small scale generate the small scale is uh, basically uh, boxed by the um, by black rectangle box and uh, here the dissipation or diffusion takes place and the um, large scale filament over it erupt out so um, magnetic reconnection is basically a very uh, poorly understood concept in the uh, uh, astrophysical plasmas and now i would like to tell uh, about one more problem with the solar flare physics that is uh, the solar flares are basically fast uh, time scale uh, process and it is impulsive in nature which can be seen from the right hand side figure which is the energy curve uh, in several electromagnetic uh, band and the region High, uh, marked by the red dashed vertical lines uh, tells uh, gives the uh, gives the uh, right, uh, enhancement in the several uh, bands so you can see this is impulsive and occurring at the very uh, short time scale sorry uh, now uh, we can see we we have seen that the mag uh, magnetic reconnection time scale or diffusion time scale for flare is of the order of few minutes and if i take the uh, time uh, diffusion time scale and calculate the length scale for reconnection then it comes out to be of the order of few meet, few tens of meters which locally reduces the magnetic reynolds number so coming back to the uh, existing models of the uh, magnetic reconnection which we i think all know uh, about the very famous sweet parker reconnection model which is uh, given on the left on uh, left hand side on the slide and the petschek reconnection model sweet parker is basically the slow reconnection model so the reconnection rates achieved from this are uh, really slow which are uh, mentioned at the bottom so as we have seen the flares are really fast and this model cannot accommodate for first of all for the fast time scale second one is the petschek reconnection model which definitely gives the uh, fast uh, time scale for reconnection but as both of these are steady state models so these do not account for the impulsive nature of the flare so by impulsive nature i mean the time development of current and associated electric fields if it is steady state then dbdt is zero so the djdt is also zero so what is the solution so we need to really think uh, first of all these are 2d uh, hypo uh, chskp model is the hypothetical uh, model of the realistic um, flare and these two are the theoretical models so uh, we need to think in uh, think of some model in 3d which can really accommodate uh, uh, both the problems i mentioned in the uh, introduction slide so uh, when we revisited the induction equation for solar corona as you can see it is mentioned on the top of the uh, slide so in the diffusive diffusive limit in solar corona we can see at the bottom you can see this is the diffusion limit as the reconnection scale is considered here and the delta i is the ion inertial scale length so uh, the in diffusive limit the hall term or hall effects have the higher order you can see in dimensionless um, induction equation at the bottom 
you see the order is 10 to the power minus 2, whereas the uh, order of dissipation, resistive dissipation is 10 to the power minus 7. So usually people neglect this term because of it can't be accommodated. One needs the very high resolution to do simulations with this term. But we, uh, as we can see, these two terms, the resistive dissipation and Hall are tied to each other because if you notice in the uh, equation at the top, the, the Hall term is basically curl of J cross B. So whenever this J is large, as you can see, J can be large only when the small uh, length scale is short. So if J is large, then we have the considerable diffusion term and uh, this is multiplied by B and by the order. So this term becomes the effective whenever reconnection is there. So now we thought of uh, including the Hall effects in the very uh, famous ULEC MHT uh, computational model. So what we did in this was we have uh, we have incorporated the Hall term that is given in the box. You can see, and there is DH, which is Hall parameter. I mentioned in the previous slide also. And uh, with this, this was added and tested. And the results are and technique are documented in the uh, publication given at the bottom of the page. We solve the dimension left Hall MHT uh, equations with this model. Now to study the uh, realistic uh, solar flare scenario with uh, Hall, Hall MHT and MHT, we have carried out the simulation. So this work is basically the combination of uh, the uh, flare observations used from the AEA SDO and GOES X-ray data. Then, as we know that the uh, uh, 3D magnetic field measurement in the uh, chromosphere or corona are uh, very rare, and only photospheric magnetic field are uh, uh, we get we get routine measurements uh, from HMI SDO. So we have applied the non-force free technique to construct the 3D magnetic field uh, for uh, flaring active region using HMI uh, photospheric magn magnetogram data. Then we uh, solved the set of uh, equations I uh, just uh, showed a slide back and we carried out the uh, uh, two type of simulations in the presence and absence of Hall MHD. Then what we did, we studied the magnetic field line evolution and magnetic reconnection especially uh, from both the models. And we tried to look uh, for the observations, how the field lines behave and how reconnection matches temporally and spatially with the observation. So uh, as you can see, as I play the movie on the left hand side, which is AIA 1, 131 Engstrom movie, I would like to stop it here just to focus on some specific features. And now I would like to play the AIA 304 Engstrom movie. Um, yeah, I would like to stop it here. So please uh, pay, uh, um, I mean, pay attention to the W shape of this uh, flare brightening. And there is a circular rotation on the left hand side at uh, around 326 UP. So by identifying or by uh, classifying these uh, uh, flare brightening, the temporal development of this flare brightening, we uh, try to look for, uh, so I would like to skip, skip this slide as I have already mentioned uh, the features in animation. Yeah, we carried out the non-force free extrapolation. And uh, you can see uh, the brightening has the total flare brightening on the spatial and temporal basis, development basis has been divided in four parts. And the magnetic field uh, topology was analyzed in these four regions. So uh, at the flare uh, saturation side, you can see there is a very complex magnetic field. It's a, it is top down view, so it looks uh, like 2D only, but uh, it is 3D. And at the middle where this uh, tip of W uh, shape is there, there is a, a 3D null point. And uh, on left hand side, there is a huge null point like structure which looks like the, that exists uh, linearly and it is known as null line structure. Okay, so I would like to actually split the uh, region and to show in 3D what it is, what is what. In region one, as we, we have seen this uh, complex magnetic field structure, then uh, I will explain them one by one. First one in panel B, you can see there are two sets of field lines. One is maroon and another one is in, uh, green. So all, both of them are the QSL. As you can see on the bottom boundary, the Q map are, are plotted. And in panel C, the structure below these uh, maroon and green field lines are mentioned. You can see there is a black uh, structure and above that there is an, another QSL. 
sitting lower in the atmosphere, solar atmosphere. And in D, I have plotted the uh, flux loop uh, separately. And you can see there are three planes and the twist varying uh, twist value plotted uh, along the cross section of the flux loop. You can note the uh, maximum twist at the cent uh, central axis of the flux loop, which is around two, the blue uh, shaded region. Okay, so uh, in region uh, two, the, the null point was found and uh, we have uh, detected it using the null detection method uh, by Gaussian method and we found the null point and you can see the uh, clear spine fan uh, configuration around this null point. Uh, and uh, in region three, where I was saying that uh, we have found out, find out the uh, null point along a linear line. So it was also verified using the null detection technique and you can see there is a yellow, uh, I mean, cylindrical surface kind of a thing that is basically the null line. And the uh, structure around it is the spine fan configuration. So when I found this, I found in the literature that such structure was hypothetically proposed in the hymen wines FJ letter. And you can see it is there. They named it as fishbone structure. So uh, for the uh, uh, simplification, I have plotted uh, fishbone structure separately. And finally, at the region uh, four, which was at uh, circular brightening part, this one, uh, region four, it is basically the extension of uh, null line into the into the uh, region four. So from region three to region four. Now, I uh, basically we have explored the magnetic field line evolution. All the all uh, I mentioned uh, here up to here. So I would go by uh, one by one. So this is the, uh, the, the dynamics I'm showing is the uh, at the flaring saturation side. So let, uh, if I play the movie, then you can see. On the left hand side, the, uh, the Hall MHD simulation and on right hand side, the MHD simulation is playing. So from this animation itself, one thing is visually clear that the field line evolution in the Hall MHD is faster than the MHD. So the main difference we can see that the uh, there is a slipping reconnection on the bottom boundary and due to that the field lines are rising uh, removing the uh, magnetic pressure above the flux rope and uh, the maroon color field line rise up to there and then they reconnect there in back so um, but in the previous animation the dynamics of flux rope was not visible so i have uh, i'm showing it separately here which will give the clear picture what what is happening to flux loop? So I would like Kamlesh, to only two comment. minutes are left. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so you can see that in Hall MHT, the flux loop is uh, evolving very fast and also higher. Whereas in in Hall MHT, whereas in MHD, the flux loop is still um, uh, evolving very slowly and it is it is not rising very high. So what is happening is. Above this flux loop, there are the QSLs I have mentioned, and that is removing the pressure from, um, above from the uh, magnetic fl uh, flux loop to let it evolve in the solar atmosphere. So uh, now coming to the middle part, which is the most interesting part of this uh, thing. So there the null point uh, topology was present, and you can see from this animation. Sorry for this. Now I would like to stop it here and would like you to appreciate the fact that in the left hand side, I don't know how clear it is. I mean, can you see this clearly? Yeah. So at the middle, you can see some field lines are anchored at the tip of that W point. So what is happening, uh, what might be happening is the reconnection uh, going on at the 3D null point. After that, the, particle, uh, the plasma parcel may accelerate to downwards and hit the bottom to give rise to the, this tip of uh, W shape brightening. Whereas in the Hall MHD, whereas in MHD, there is no connection to the uh, bottom boundary was found, which is which uh, which makes us which made us to think that uh, if the there is no uh, field line connection from here, then how would uh, the particles will travel down and uh, hit the bottom boundary to give this uh, give rise to this uh, flare brightening? So this is the, uh, I mean, uh, interesting and amazing result from all MHD simulation. So now I would like to skip the result of region three because the uh, topological uh, evolution was same and uh, it can be found in the paper also, which I'll uh, come to next. 
and this is the uh, this is the animation of the magnetic field line evolution in region four, where you can see I have plotted the uh, direction of the flow by red arrows. You can see, and uh, the field lines are rotating in circular pattern. And this was exactly found in the observation. You 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 may notice at the B four there was a circular uh, rotation of the plasma material in the observation. So this phenomena was basically absent in the MHD. It was not found in the MHD, but Hall MHD simulation is exactly rep replicating it spatially and temporally. So now coming to the summary and future scopes, uh, some future scopes of this of the work. So we have seen that the flux rope are uh, erupting with a with an in unique mechanism. So all we know is from uh, our previous knowledge, we know the flux rope eruption uh, mechanisms such as the ideal MHD instabilities and uh, that CHSKP model, which uh, I just mentioned. But the flux rope erupting uh, here is uh, through the slipping reconnection at the foot point, which is uh, very less documented in the literature and not explored much. So in, real, in reality, the... Um, Solar eruption or solar flare are very complex and elusive processes for which we really need to do the 3D simulation. And as from this work, uh, we can see that Hall MHD is more promising in explaining the observed C1.3 class flare brightening in this active region. So uh, we will, uh, in future, we would like to uh, study and analysis uh, on the impulsive nature of observed flaring event, which we haven't done for this. We have only verified or found the uh, Fast reconnection, faster reconnection, and the spatial and temporal ma ma match of observed feature with field line evolution. So we have also planned to simulate with 3D flux ropes for two cases. One is for free pre-existing uh, that will that will be help in help that will help in understanding the evolution of uh, filament and prominences and the flux ropes generated from the 3D bipolar shear target. Maybe then we uh, will be able to add some more information to the existing CHSKP model and we can give model like CHSKP. So that's all. Thanks for paying attention. And uh, this work has been uh, published in APJ and uh, you can go and read it. Yeah, so thanks Kamles. I think time is up. We have only, we can take only one question very quick. Please raise your hands. The bunker, uh, the Bindu's hand is raised. I think it's from previous time. I think uh, are so. Anyone else? In person, there is one hand. Okay, so please go ahead. Yeah, uh, nice uh, as usually always uh, very nice talk. Uh, the time scales, what you see, you are all dimensional. Mm -hmm. So, what are the physical times you are comparing? With? Yeah, actually, so in this, the, in these simulations, which I, I forgot to mention, uh, the one time, uh, the the t equal to one corresponds to the seventeen point seven five uh, second. So, when I'm solving dimensionless equation, I can anytime multiply it with the Elvin time scale or whatever time scale uh, I have normalized the equations with. Then I can get, get the physical time from that. So, when I uh, cal I uh, did that, I found that in observation, this uh, circular rotational motion of field line exactly matches at the 326 UT. So, at 326 UT, the um, circular uh, this thing, uh, the yeah, circular the, feature is... The flux rope evolution is yeah, considered to be much slower. So I was just wondering how does it compare? Yeah, this? actually, uh, yeah. So it's mentioned in the paper definitely, but I forgot to mention mm -hmm. it here. So as if I uh, stop it here. So you can see here. So, so there is t equal to 44. And if I multiply it with the um, time scale, the physical time scale, it gives me the time scale of the eruption, which we uh, saw in the... Uh, observation but because of being incompressible model we were not able to say much about the cme because it has the domain limit it was only 71 megameter height from the bottom thank you okay so thanks kamlesh it's now time to go to the next speaker there are some questions in the chat kamlesh you can answer that so our next speaker is prateek mayank who is doing phd at iit indore working with dr bhargav vaidya 
so he will be speaking on data driven solar wind prediction at l1 so this work the he, this effort will be very helpful when aditya l1 data comes so please pratik go ahead share your screen please okay. so thank you uh, is the screen visible yes yes okay i think uh, it should be in full screen now yes yes okay good afternoon everyone uh, this is prateek mank and uh, i will be presenting on physics based solar wind model which will complement the upcoming aditya l1 mission so we all know the adverse effect of space weather and uh, to mitigate its effect we need to prepare our timely rational response and for that we need to understand the underlying physics so the current observatories or the observational capabilities had developed very much uh, and uh, at present they provide a good starting point for the study but they don't produce the required insight of the arrival time of these space weather events so in these type of situations numerical models become very handy and by using the observational capabilities as an input like magnetograms we can develop modeling capabilities and whose output will be again complemented by the space based observations in the heliosphere so right now there are many existing models which are uh, which are aiming to solve this problem and uh, still there is a vast scope of improvement as far as matching with the observations at l1 point is concerned so with the with this aim uh, we we have developed an indigenous space with adaptive simulation framework and we have named it swasti and uh, today i am uh, going to talk about the solar wind module of this framework that is swasti sw so the purpose of this uh, model is twofold first is forecasting the plasma uh, properties of solar wind on sirs in the inner heliosphere and the second is to study the high speed streams and the stream interaction regions so this model uses the uh, input uh, uses an integral synoptic magnetogram as an input both hmi or uh, gong and uh, solves the and solves or computes and gives the plasma properties in the inner heliosphere up to 2.1 au so this model is based on two domain approach uh, first is semi uh, semi empirical coronal domain and second is msd based inner heliospheric domain in the coronal domain uh, we have used pfss model to solve for the com uh, for the magnetic field from solar surface to source surface which is 2.5 solar radius in our case and from source surface to 21.5 solar radius we have used a scattering current sheet to solve the magnetic field so once uh, we solve for the magnetic field in the corona region we get fs and d of which i will talk in the next slide and uh, by getting fs fs and d we use the wsi empirical relation to get the speed profile at 0.1 au which is the boundary condition for the mhd domain so once we have the speed profile we use empirical relations for other plasma properties and we solve the mhd equations to get the plasma properties in the inner heliosphere for this we use pluto code and as well as we also we have also used the hux uh, which is heliospheric upwind extrapolation technique which basically neglects the magnetic uh, effects of magnetic field gravity and pressure but it's computationally very fast and uh, gives an essence of the final result before the mhd run so once we had the magnetogram uh, we solve for the magnetic field and uh, trace the magnetic field lines using the coronal model so here i have shown the tracing of open field lines for cr2081 uh, which reaches the sub earth points the cyan and orange are those magnetic field lines open magnetic field lines and those uh, and the foot points of these field lines are denoted by red and the green is the coronal hole and the dark, gray patches are the closed magnetic field lines of opposite polarity so this whole thing has been projected in theta phi plane and the cyan and orange field lines are originating from the source uh, solar surface and reaching up to the sub earth points so once we have uh, this tracing of magnetic field lines using the coronal model we get the d and fs so d is basically the minimum distance of foot point of the open field line from the nearest coronal hole boundary and fs is the expansion factor so once we have d and fs we have to use or we are using a wsi relation the original wsi relation has four independent parameters v minimum v maximum w and beta and we have generalized this uh, equation wsi relation modified it 
and reduce one independent variable. And we notice that if we take W, which basically normalizes the effect of D parameter here, then it gives better result for most of the cases. So in this, in this way, we got rid of one independent parameter. And now we have three V minimum, V maximum, and beta. And we have to optimize it and in such a way that we get good results. So once we do that, then we get the speed profile, the 2D speed profile at 0.1 AU. And then we get the uh, magnetic field profile also using that. So this, uh, so once we have the boundary conditions at 0.1 AU, then we solve the MSD equations in the inner heliosphere from 0.1 to 2.1 uh, AU and from minus 60 to 60 in the latitude direction and from zero to 360 in longitude. So the resolution here used is 150 into 120 into 360. And uh, the top three plots are for the radial component of velocity and the bottom three are for the radial component of magnetic field and uh, the proton density and proton temperature. Here one can see that there is a snake-like structure or zigzag structure in the middle of uh, the theta phi plane diagrams. That is basically the uh, uh, current sheet region or the polarity inversion line, where uh, we can see that the value of uh, wind is, the speed is, uh, the value is low, as well as the density is higher. And uh, in the theta phi plane, uh, in the R theta plane, which is the B here, we, get, we can see that the speed is slow for the reason of minus 30 degree to 30 degree, and beyond that, uh, the high speed streams are there. To validate the results of our model, uh, we chose five CRs lying in the region of solar minima to a little above near the uh, middle of the solar maxima and minima, and compared the results with per hour average Omni data. And these are the five current and rotations. And uh, overall, basically, the result captures the basic features of the observed solar wind at L1.1 uh, 1 AU. And uh, the three uh, things that I marked here that denotes the basic difference between HUX and MHD results, in which uh, uh, we can see that there is a very high uh, steep in the HUX results, but not in the MHD. That is, uh, MHD is incorporating the pressure and magnetic fields due to which it, uh, it increases, uh, the slope is gradual, and uh, which is basically the, that is happening in the observation also. In the, for the CR2104, we have also compared the both gong and hmi results and that's for only one and the gong has uh, is get, get giving the better results especially it is capturing the peak the main peak around uh, 240 but that is not happening in the hmi case so apart from uh, the speed we have also compared other uh, plasma properties for this uh, for one cr i've shown it for one cr that is cr2081 so the default value of polytropic index that we have taken is 1.67 and uh, which is in the blue, uh, which is a blue profile. And the magnetic field uh, is matching pretty well, but it is overestimating the density and underestimating the temperature. So we have varied the polytri uh, polytropic index to see that what happens to density and temperature. And we saw that the density and temperature are getting, the match is getting better, but the match uh, for magnetic field getting worse. So it, it cannot be a, like a, really a correlation, a direct correlation between these two. And uh, this is the thing that we have to explore in the future. So coming to the statistical part. So I've shown the result for uh, so, uh, solar wind speed and compared with the Omni data, the results are the correlation coefficient and the root mean square error. The MSD run, that is the Pluto, uh, slightly light green in the color, shows more consistent results. And the correlation coefficient has been for these CRs been above always uh, always been above the 0.7 and the root mean square error has been always uh, less than 80 km per second for, for all the five CRs. So apart from forecasting the plasma properties uh, in the inner heliosphere, model can also be used to study the stream interaction regions. So if we focus on the A plot, which is the first five uh, vertically, so that shows the value of these properties, which are uh, velocity, magnetic field density, at the L1 point. So, and the four, uh, the, the thing that we have chosen is the one isolated uh, SIR, which was for the CR, first quadrant of CR2081. And I've classified into uh, broadly into four regions that is S, S prime, uh, F, and F prime. So, the shaded one is the compressed region where the high uh, fast wind is interacting with the slow wind, and there is a compressed region. And in that region, we already know that the magnetic field intensity increases as well as the density also increases. And we, what we also observe that the 
longitudinal component of velocity shows directional fluctuations. So there are some peculiar traits in the meridional and azimuthal directions uh, for the SIRs. So what we uh, what we did that we tried to mimic the observation, the potential observations of Swiss by forming three computational surfaces uh, around the detectors. And the plot is for that. The A, B, C are those computational surfaces. And uh, we average the quantity and then the plot is on the B side. It is for the average for the whole computational surface, not for just L1 point. So we can see just for the verification, I plotted the VR also and the V5, it's matching with the L1 point, means that the, the that formula we use is working. So VR and V5 is showing the same trend and the rest uh, three at the bottom are for the uh, proton flux. And we see that in the radial direction, there is an upsurge in the proton flux. In the theta direction, there is a directional switch. Whereas in the phi direction, these are in the spherical coordinates. So there in the phi direction, there is a directional fluctuation. So these are some peculiar traits that we uh, observed in the results of our model. And uh, knowing that the Swiss has that multi-directional observational capability. So uh, it will be very interesting that once it deployed. I think three minutes, are, yeah. Sure. Yeah, so I'm done. So th this is my summary slide. So uh, we have successfully developed and validated the results of three-dimensional MHD solar wind forecasting model and computes the plasma pro properties from 0.1 AU to 2.1 AU using gong or HMI magnetogram. And in the, in the future work, we are planning to uh, incorporate CME in this, uh, uh, creating this model as the ambient background. So the current version of uh, this model, so the SW takes around six to eight hours for the given resolution to come for a complete run of one current rotation on 48 cores. So we have generalized, we have also generalized the, w, uh, the current existing WSA speed relation by decreasing the number of independent parameters. Especially it helps uh, uh, in, gives a freedom in deciding the computational grid resolution, especially in theta and phi direction. The study of uh, this MHD model shows that the multi-directional observation uh, can be, uh, can be, will be a uh, reliable detection technique for SIRs when we are not only detecting on the radial, but also in the theta and phi. And once the Swiss goes, we'll have that capability that will be observing the uh, SIRs from theta and phi uh, and uh, theta phi in our direction. So it will be a great opportunity to study SIRs. So thank you. Okay, thanks Pratik. We have time for a couple of questions. So please, yeah. So Sudeep had one question. Please Sudeep, unmute and ask your question. Yeah, please go ahead. I think you are uh, not audible. Okay, hello. Yes, yes. Okay, hi Pratik, nice talk. Yeah. So uh, my question is about the fact you mentioned in the beginning of your presentation that you optimize your code while you run it for the first time. Uh, do you need to do it all, uh, for every character rotation? Uh, okay, no, uh, not for every current rotation. So basically, uh, these are the default values. And uh, uh, for W, we take the median of D. And uh, for for just the study to how the things get changed or how, how to change the value of beta gives the better results, we sometimes optimize. So the results shown here are actually we have run the HUX, then compared with the observation and the, the, the value for which we get the best result goes inside the MSD domain. So, so in, uh, the, in real time, it's not a problem. No. So default value is 1.25 for assessment. Okay. We optimize. Okay. Okay. So Thank there you. is a question in chat. Have a question so, audience so Pratik, there is a question in chat. It is like, uh, are there any theoretical limitations of using MHD model with respect to solar wind studies? Uh, yeah, physically, uh, solar wind plasma is a collisionless plasma and MHD is valid for uh, this uh, collision plasma. So yeah, uh, it's a, it's an approximation. Uh, but the thing is that uh, we also are bound due to the computational power that we have, even if you write a good code, uh, the, the thing that it will take much more time. So from the space for the forecasting perspective, if it is taking more than three or four days in getting the results, then that doesn't work. And uh, this uh, approximation is somewhat uh, giving uh, significantly good results, so it just works. Okay, so next question. We have a couple of questions from the audience. Okay, here. yeah, please. Okay, uh, hi, so uh, I wanted to know that uh, 
in, in the solar wind uh, simulation that you have shown, um, what is the reason for the latitudinal variation in this field? How quickly we are getting it? Okay. Uh, are you talking about yeah, the, the computational domain or the result? Yeah, the, the, B, the B panel here. Yeah. So you have different, uh, the solar wind speeds at different latitudes. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So how exactly uh, it is coming up? Okay, so uh, we are using the magnetogram, then extrapolating the magnetic field 2.1 AU, and then uh, we are empirically, empirically giving the results, the properties uh, at 0.1 AU. And once we have the whole, uh, for 0 to 360, we have all the plasma properties, then we rotate uh, this boundary condition, and uh, that's what integrated synoptic magnetogram so has. Physically, what is happening? Why, uh, why at the higher latitudes you have more speed? Right? Okay, so that is uh, due to this uh, D parameter, so if we focus on this, uh, yeah, D parameter. So for the latitude greater than 30, we can see that the value of D is higher. So the velocity component in this WSA is directly, is directly what exactly is yeah. the physical? so D is the, from how deep inside the coronal hole, the uh, magnetic field is originating. So if the magnetic field is originating from deep inside the coronal hole, the magnetic, the velocity will be higher. If it's uh, at the periphery of the coronal hole, it will be lower. So that is the origin of uh, uh, high speed solar wind, according to you, according to your model, right? Yeah. Okay. Fine. You have another question. I was just wondering. There are some IPS observations and uh, yeah. from Muji, so yeah. because it has a two D similar, uh, you know, uh, behavior what we've seen here simulation. Yeah. Have you tried to compare with some of those? No, uh, we haven't tried that. But I was thinking to uh, do that. Uh, it will be very nice see. because your yeah. movies look very similar to IPS uh, reconstructions. Okay. You know, of okay. course, for uh, past uh, Kalinjian rotations, uh, it doesn't exist now. The other question I have is, in with your uh, resolution, are you able to uh, resolve the CIRs? CI, yeah. So no, I mean, I see some boundaries, but uh, is it really you can say that? Uh, effectively, you are uh, able to resolve the CIS because I, I okay. see your resolutions are not very high yet. Yeah, so the radial resolution is not very high, it's 150, <clears throat> but the resolution in theta and phi is of one degree. So I think that that's uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think just uh, following what Weber was pointing out, see, early simulations they had the dead zone and they had, uh, you know, uh, now the BAC. Uh, back uh, community, Ronnie Capens and all that, they had the solar wind yeah. model. Yeah. They impose a similar way. Yeah. The low latitudes as a slow wind and the high latitude at the, uh, you know, uh, uh, from the higher uh, latitude. And they used to have a dead zone. So you, do you encounter such a dead zone uh, somewhere, which is equivalent to this yeah. CIR, you can say. Okay. So one thing that uh, uh, there is a one challenge is that whether we are correctly uh, able to figure out the coronal hole area. The boundary is clear or not? Yeah. So for that, the source region gets becomes very tricky. So and it also that if we have to be like make some uh, something like uh, for each stage of the solar cycle, it's changing because solar maxima means so, uh, source region will be a little uh, lower and the for I mean, minima it will be higher. So for now, it's the is the first version. So we have just kept it one so two point five. So later uh, we are going to find some empirical relation to increase or decrease. Okay, so let's move to the next talk. Pratik, I think uh, it's time to wrap up. Yeah. So thank you for this nice presentation. So now we came to the last talk of this session by Sanvita Paul. So I request her to share her screen. And she is doing PhD at a safety center of ISER Kolkata with Dr. Dibendu Nandi. So she will be speaking on large scale dipole moment and polar field buildup on the sun. Yeah, it's visible. Please do it full screen. Yeah, it's done. So please go ahead, Sonita. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Shaunita from Sesi Alsa, Kolkata. 
uh, first of all, thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share my work here. Uh, today, I'll be discussing the impact of anomalous active regions on the large scale magnetic field of the sun. So before diving into what are the anomalous active regions and how they can change the solar cycle dynamics, let me start with a brief motivation. Okay, so uh, we are always interested to study the magnetic field of the sun. And the first discovery was come by George Hill in 1908 that the sunspots are uh, the seeds of stronger magnetic field. And this number of sunspots generally increases and decreases in a periodic manner and thus generates the, the 11 year solar cycle. So uh, it is always important to, to have a prior idea about the, the, um, the amplitude of the solar cycle because they are closely connected to the different solar activities that is going on in the sun. So you can see several attempts have been made by a different group of uh, scientists to, to predict the future solar cycle amplitude. Uh, like in this picture, you can see there are different predictions for solar cycle 24 and solar cycle 25 as well. Uh, by using different techniques, but uh, but still it's quite challenging to, to predict the amplitude of the solar cycle because uh, there are some irregularities or some some cyclic variations that they are seen in the in the solar cycle. Uh, like uh, as for example, uh, the the there is a there is a certain decrease in the amplitude of the solar cycle 24 in comparison to the old uh, i mean the previous cycles so here our motivations comes in to to explore the the cause of this type of variations or or the irregularities that is uh, seen in the soaking cycle so the uh, the magnetic field generation inside the sun can be can be well explained by the babcock lyton solar dynamo theory uh, I'm not going to detail on it, but uh, in short, due to the differential rotation, the, the polaroidal field generally stretches into the toroidal field. And uh, once, uh, once it is generated, it rises to the convection zone due to buoyancy, uh, like, like a omega flux tube. And when it breaks to the surface, uh, the bipolar magnetic sunspot generates. So once the sunspot are emerges, uh, their evolution can be, I mean, on the solar surface can be explained by babcock lyton theory. So where it says that, you can see it here, the, the leading polarity cancellation is happening due to the magnetic diffusivity and the, the differential rotation. And then the unipolar, that is the blue one, unipolar following spot migrates towards a pole and ultimately alters the global dipolar field of the sun. Uh, we are very much familiar with different uh, uh, different characteristics that is uh, seen in the solar cycle. One of them is Hell's polarity law, so which says that the the orientation and the magnetic polarities are are same in a particular hemisphere, but it uh, di uh, differs from one hemisphere to another hemisphere. It it also changes its orientation from one cycle to next cycle. There is another law known as Joyce law, which says that Generally, the tilt angle of the sunspot increases along with the latitude. And uh, by conventionally, it is positive in the northern hemisphere and it's negative in the, in the southern hemisphere. Uh, in reality, we, we have seen there are some sunspots which, which does not obey this health polarity rule and the joyous law. And uh, we term them as anti-hill region or anti-joy region. Uh, well, so there are uh, several model-based studies uh, that they, they showed that the babcock lyton mechanism is the primary driver of the, of the solar cycle variability, and uh, this abnormal region can, can cause these variations. Uh, also, uh, a rock sun, sunspot, so that, that uh, red circle can see it here. So the rock sunspot can, can create a great impact in the polar field buildup, uh, which we generally determines the next cycle strength. Uh, also, there are some database studies uh, where, where they have claimed that these type of abnormal regions are generally coming uh, into, into percentage with percentage. And this percentage varies with uh, from 4% from to 10% uh, uh, in different solar cycles. So uh, inspired from this, uh, we have made a thorough investigation 
uh, by incorporating this uh, abnormal regions in the solar cycle and we'll see how this will affect the photospheric magnetic field. So for our study, we have uh, categorized the bipolar magnetic region in four cases. So the first one is the normal one, which is Helljoy BMR. The second one is the anti-hill sunspot. The third one is anti-joy sunspot. And the fourth one is both anti-hill, anti-joy sunspot. So for our uh, study, these last three uh, are, are different from the normal scenario, and we term them as anomalous active region. Uh, we have used surface flux transport model for our study where uh, it solves the radial component of the induction equation under uh, different uh, large scale transport profile like differential rotation, maritonal circulation, and the magnetic diffusivity. So this code was uh, solved in spectral domain and it was used to predict the solar cycle 25 by Bhumi and Nandi in 2018. Uh, you can also see there is a term that is eighth term in the, in the equation. It is the source term which generally mimics the new emergence, I mean the emergence of new active region. And this source term contains the information of uh, the emergence of uh, phases, latitudes, longitudes, and also the, the tilt angle and the flux contained by the BMR. So to uh, model this source term, we have uh, prepared a synthetic data. So uh, it's in inspired from Hathaway and Jiang. So here uh, in, the, uh, in the first panel, you can see this is the time series of uh, the sunspot number uh, for our synthetic data. And uh, this is the corresponding butterfly diagram. Uh, now uh, we have incorporated the, the anomalous active regions in the solar cycle randomly distributed uh, all over the cycle. So these black stars you can see is the uh, anomalous active regions. Uh, we have also prepared some different distribution that is depending on emergence phases and latitude. So in the first panel, uh, this is the variations in emergence phases. So uh, in this here, it is uh, the, the anomalous regions are coming more at initial phase. Here it is coming more at middle phase. And here it is more at end phase. Uh, in the second panel, uh, this, this is the variations in emergence latitudes. So we can see it here, more, more anomalous regions are coming near the upper latitude, more uh, are near the middle latitude, and more near the equatorial region. And the last panel uh, captures the hemispheric dominance. So more anomalous regions are seen in northern hemisphere and it's seen in southern hemisphere. Uh, well, for our initial study, we uh, have used the, the distribution where the anomalous regions are distributed all over the cycle. So that black dots are uh, represents these anomalous regions. Uh, now, as we know, the, the actual dipole moment can act as a good precaution of the uh, next cycle amplitude and the, and the cycle length. So here we are seeing the time evolution of the actual dipole moment. Uh, what we have found is there is a decrease in actual dipole moment and the, at the end of the cycle. And also there is a delay in reversal timing. Uh, uh, we have uh, found that case one and case four, that is the green and pink curve, that are giving the same results, whereas case two or uh, case three are also behaving in the same way. So to study it in detail, uh, we have studied the time evolution of a single active region. Uh, so in the top panel, it is uh, the time evolution of the anti-hill region. And in the bottom panel, it is the same for anti-joy region. So um, uh, uh, due to the differential rotation uh, in, the, in the second panel, you can see the following polarity, that is the red one. So uh, due to the differential rotation, this red one being near the equator, it will face more shear than the, uh, than the leading, leading polarity. And as the time goes on, it will eventually take the same orientation as the anti-hill region. So uh, here is a short uh, animation where in the first panel, you can see how the anti-joy region is becoming the anti-hill region. And in the, in the second panel, it's the anti-hill, anti-joy regions is becoming the hill-joy region. Uh, further, uh, we have uh, studied the dependence on active region percentage and flux. So for that, uh, we have prepared four cases. 
the, the minimum amount of uh, flux and percentage we choose is 5% and the maximum is 10%. Uh, so what we have found is uh, if the anomalous regions are containing more amount of flux, then there will be more decrease in the in the dipole movement. So the flux is playing a dominant role in the in ruling the solar cycle dynamics. Uh, also, uh, another uh, interesting fact is that if you have a single log region and uh, you have a 5% anomalous regions and both of them are carrying the same amount of flux, then the single log region will be less impactful than the 5% than the anomalous regions. So not only the flux, but also the accurate information of the anomalous active region percentages are important. Uh, lastly, uh, uh, as I have mentioned earlier, we have prepared different distribution depending on the uh, on the active agent phases and latitudes. Uh, so uh, this is the, again the time evolution of the actual dipole movement, and this A1 cutout is the uh, uh, violet highlighted region, and this A2 cutout is the uh, blue highlighted region. So um, uh, if uh, if the anterior regions are appearing. Uh, more at a particular phase, then more opposite polarity surges will happen at that stage only. So as for example, if uh, this, this, they are appearing more at the, at the initial phase, so the influence, influence will be less. You can see it in the black circle. Uh, again, uh, if they are appearing more at the end phase, then the in influence will be more, so you will get more decrease in dipole movement. Uh, if uh, these regions are appearing more at the middle phase, as we all know, the the uh, the generally the axial dipole movement reverses its polarity at the at the middle phase, so the reversal time will be getting delayed. So, so now the dependence two minutes, on two minutes, yeah. Uh, so the, now the dependence on uh, active region latitudes. So if uh, these regions are coming more near the upper latitude. So the, there will be minimum decrease in dipole movement, and this impact will be highest if uh, if they are coming uh, near the equator, equatorial region. So you can see it uh, in the black circle. So now uh, it's a time for a summar summarization. What I have said so far is uh, opposite polarity remnant flux surges are playing an uh, important role in the polar field buildup and dipole movement buildup. Uh, if there are, uh, there are uh, more anti-hill regions or anti gel regions are appearing in a solar cycle, then uh, the next cycle amplitude will decrease and it will also affect the solar cycle length. Uh, anti hill regions and anti gel regions are, are generally contributing same in the polar field buildup. And uh, for, for a good prediction, we should know uh, uh, about the accurate uh, information of the flux and, flux and uh, percentage that is carried by this, this anomalous region. And uh, lastly, as we have prepared different distributions, so we will we are getting highest impact from if the these anomalous regions are appearing near the equatorial region and near the middle phase. So uh, this work will will help us to understand how the hill joy region along with the anomalous active region can can help us in assessing or 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 in predicting the future solar cycle strength. And it also gives us some insight how, how these regions are creating the irregularities in the solar cycle. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. So please uh, raise your hands using this. You have questions? Zoom feature. Thank you. Amit, a very yeah. nice talk. Thank you. I think strongly that you may have a also relation with the sizes of the sunspots. You know, our or this rogue yeah. region, what you're talking about. Yeah. Because your result, uh, you know, perfectly matches with my guess. Because you would expect the largest sunspots to be closer to the equator rather than high latitudes, uh, in any case, and on the middle of the phase as well. Yes. So, what I'm trying to say is that in your initial selection, mm -hmm. if you put a threshold on okay. your sizes of the, you know, rogue sunspots as well, you may find better correlation. Okay, I get it. But in our study, basically, we are considering all possibilities. So we are not uh, interested in a particular rock region. I mean, well, that is you, containing high amount of flux or right, high amount. As you said, you know, mm -hmm. these particular rogue regions, which are really influencing the polarity reversal, yes, or, yes. you know, mm -hmm. uh, build up and the next cycle strength and all that, mm -hmm. you have to identify them better. Na? Okay, okay, and understand. If you, if you uh -huh. can identify better, what are the period they're coming? 
In fact, there are claims that even they are important for space weather effects the next cycle. Yes. And the timing of the next cycle, the space weather you can do based on these row details. These are claims, of course. Yeah. But uh, yeah. if you first selection criteria has to be more, you know, specific, mm -hmm. then probably, you know. Okay, uh, I, 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 will, I will check it. Yeah, thanks for your suggestion. <laughs> Is there another question here? Yeah, so Gopal has a question online. So please, Gopal, can you unmute? Can yeah. you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, hi, Savanita. So it was nice talk. So my my question is when you're putting your um, anti hail region, right? So but your, your model is solving radial part of the equation, so BR. So when you're putting the anti hail regions, or like it depends on the different phase of the part. So mm -hmm. how are you cleaning about the divergence-free condition? Because you're putting different polarity. So at mm -hmm. the end of the day, how you're making sure that del dot B remains? Uh, yeah, zero. so uh, as I'm solving the 2D equation here, yeah. so it's itself divergence-free. And uh, uh, what you are saying that I am uh, putting the opposite polarity, yes. I'm just uh, changing the polarities of the sunspots. So I yes. guess uh, it will not affect the divergence here. So basically, we are randomly. I mean, we uh, pick up some random sunspots, uh, which uh, we uh, we make anti hill or anti joy in our for our study. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So Sudeep has a question in the chat. Sudeep, can you unmute and ask your question? No, I. I mean, so the, my yes. question. Mm -hmm. My question is uh, uh, that you mentioned that uh, if you have multiple small ones, then uh, they will have more impact uh, compared to a big one with equal amount of um, uh, anomalous flux. Mm -hmm. So in this case, uh, we see in magnetograms that we always have these small little ephemeral regions which do not obey Joy's law, mm -hmm. and they uh, they are kind of anti here. So mm -hmm. uh, do they have then bigger impact? Uh, I mean, uh, if uh, I I think uh, for I mean. Uh, I as far as my view, uh, if there is single region, then the impact will be less, whatever the flux. And, but the, there is multiple region, there will be more interactive region cancellation, right? So that they can uh, uh, can interact with uh, more neighbors, uh, neighbor sunspots. So flux cancellation will be more in that case. So mm -hmm. I guess uh, if there is multiple emergence, the impact will be high, and higher than the single, single region appearance. Okay, but the interesting thing is these ephemeral regions are always there. So mm, yeah, I know. We see there, uh, we do not see all the cycles getting affected. Yeah, uh, for that case, uh, I mean, there is a paper by Jiang in 2015. So I just mm. so you were you were saying that this type of region, right, uh, right, uh, in near the equator. So it's no, a highly few... tilted region and uh, carrying the high amount of flux. So you can see uh, it's affecting large at the end. Okay, thank you. So are there any questions, please? If there are no questions, so we let's thank the speaker. And uh, with this, we come to end of this session. Let's thank all the speaker of this session. And it, there were very nice talks in this session. So thank you all. I hand over to the host if they have uh, some announcement to make, please. Yeah, we shall resume at uh, four thirty-five because it's already we are running little short of time.